Welcome everyone to the second annual Campus Nature Rx Symposium. I'm Don Raykow, an associate professor in the School of Integrative Plant Science at Cornell University and the co-coordinator along with Dr. Dorothy Ebis of the Campus Nature Rx Network. Those of you who are newer to this group may be wondering what Campus Nature Rx or CNRx is all about. We're a loose federation of colleges and universities that organize programs that encourage and support students and other university and college personnel to engage with nature. This simple matter can be accomplished many different ways, as you'll be hearing from our 12 presenters today. We've known for centuries that spending time in nature is beneficial to human health. Rates of stress, anxiety, and depression can be reduced. Blood pressure and salivary cortisol levels can come down and our ability to concentrate and recall facts can be improved. These are all vitally important conditions for college students who have been suffering from unprecedented levels of both psychological and physiological problems. And that was even before the pandemic made things even worse. The college experience is many things academic courses, of course, but also an opportunity for students to socialize with friends, learn new skills, become involved with athletic or artistic groups, and to spend time figuring out who they truly are. It can be easy for a student to feel that these competing demands leave no time for being out in nature. Also, across the country, campuses certainly vary in how much green space they have to offer. But one of the basic tenets of Campus Nature Rx is that every school has at least some patches of green where students can take a quick break to unwind, rebalance, and feel the earth. We're so pleased that the CNRX network, begun just two and a half years ago, has now grown to nearly 30 campuses. If you're interested in having your school join the network, please send a request to Dr. Dorothy Ebus at dcibes at email.wm.edu. If, however, you're not quite ready for that next step and would like to learn more about programs at different campuses before initiating a program at yours, you can start receiving our monthly CNRX newsletter by emailing me dr14 at cornell.edu. And you'll see instructions for both of those options on our campusnature.com website. So before we hear from our first speaker, I'd like to recognize those individuals who were most instrumental in putting together today's symposium. They are Dorothy Ebus, who I've already mentioned from William and Mary, uh, Jennifer Roberts from the University of Maryland, and Jeanette from, um, Jeanette, you are from? I'm from Calvin University. Calvin University, thank you. Thank you so much. So at this point, I am going to turn things over to Dorothy Ebus to introduce our first speakers. Thank you so much, Don. Um, and a reminder to everyone that an updated agenda for today's symposium has been posted to campusnature.com. 
Um, you can also find information there about how to sign up for the newsletter and to sign up as an institution, a formal institution of the network under our about page. Um, so presentations in our first session discuss how to start Campus Nature Rx and related programs. And I am going to start us off today. So uh, my name is Dorothy Ebus. I'm faculty at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. I teach for environmental science and policy and the Center for Geospatial Analysis. I've been teaching a William & Mary course called the Science and Experience of Ecotherapy for the last five years. I'm a trained ecotherapy guide and I also direct the Parks and Ecotherapy Research Lab. So today I'm gonna to share my experience building a campus nature lab and provide tips for those who might be interested in doing something similar. So the Parks and Ecotherapy Research Lab, formerly known as just the Parks Research Lab, is a campus lab I direct under William & Mary's Environmental Science and Policy Program. So our mission is to cultivate nature-connected communities that foster mental health, sustainability and environmental stewardship. And we do this primarily in three ways. First, by conducting interdisciplinary use inspired research that enhances understanding of the connection between mental health and nature engagement. Second, by applying research to inclusive campus projects that support diverse students and spending more time engaging with nature, both indoors and out and developing a meaningful relationship with the natural world. So these projects include the more traditional Campus Park Rx program, which for us is a peer-to-peer -peer program, but also a Campus Green Space Map, Campus Tree Tours, uh, Nurture with Nature, a documentary short film I co-produced um, with uh, Tanya Stadelman, the filmmaker. Um, also a collaboration with the library that's resulting in an outdoor study space integrating biophilic design and ecotherapy concepts and many more. And thirdly, by training the next generation of diverse green space and ecotherapy practitioners, researchers, and advocates. You can see here the list of current team members in Pearl. So instead of diving into the minutia of any one particular program today, I felt what might be most helpful would be to discuss the larger structure of the lab for those of you who may be interested in creating something similar. And I'm hoping this will provide you some useful ideas and tools, and most importantly, the confidence that you don't need to do this perfectly to create something meaningful on your campus. So I'll begin by starting the story of how we started my lab. So I started a research group during graduate school to network with other parks and open space researchers on and off campus at Arizona State University. Then when I was hired at William & Mary in 2013, I kind of took the group with me, but I could find no peer collaborators on campus. And I was getting very lonely in my office here pictured on the left. But I also noticed all these wonderfully talented and enthusiastic students all around me, pictured on the right. So I wondered if they might be interested in doing this work with me. So I posted an announcement on my department listserv inviting students to join the lab to do some research and build a green space database. Honestly, I didn't really know what I was trying to create or if anything would happen. I had no encouragement to do this from anyone. In fact, I learned years later that one of my mentors at the time said that he didn't expect a postdoc, which I was at the time, could pull this off. <laughs> but he has since been one of my biggest supporters. So within literally 15 minutes of the announcement posting, I heard someone running down the hallway towards my office. And this was Luke pictured here on the left. He said he was so excited about the opportunity that he had to come immediately to talk with me. So of course he was in and he, along with the other students that joined the lab that summer, ended up collecting some of the most critical data for what is now the Campus Green Space map, um, which you can check out at campusgreenspace.wm.edu if you're interested. During that same summer, the students and I also collected survey data for our subsequent journal publication on senior friendly parks. So um, I have advised over 40 students in the lab over the years since uh, Luke was my first. 
um, from a variety of disciplines, including environmental science, biology, psychology, neuroscience, geology, economics, American studies, urban studies, Hispanic studies, history, you name it, all across the spectrum. Um, I've tried many different configurations for the lab, but at this point, we've evolved to a particular kind of structure I'm gonna share with you today. So first, um, each student in the lab has a primary task, for example, a research assistant, a program manager, or a GIS specialist, but they are encouraged to consult each other and collaborate on projects as appropriate. Some students work in pairs on specific projects, so they have someone to bounce ideas off of. Some semesters we focus more on research, sometimes on projects and programs, and sometimes a mix. We meet for three hours a week in person synchronously and have an all hands meeting most of those weeks to kind of touch base. Students present to the lab a couple times each semester to share their progress and obtain feedback. If a student contributes significantly to a research project, they become co authors. I really emphasize self care and fun over backbreaking productivity, as I feel like that defeats the entire purpose of the endeavor. But despite this, or perhaps because of it, um, I feel Pearl students have accomplished quite a bit over the years. Uh, we have a Google Drive, we organize all our files, and that's accessible to everyone in the lab. So, this is great for kind of sharing materials. And then, several years ago, I finally created a website to keep track of and share all the things we were up to since it started to become very unwieldy to uh, explain it to people in a nutshell. So I'm really happy with how the lab has evolved over the years, but that does not mean things have always gone smoothly. Not every project or event has been a success. Not every student has loved the work. Um, we are not wildly productive. Sometimes we have wasted time and resources going down the wrong path. Projects I expected to take a semester took years. At certain times, people on campus did not understand the value of what we were doing. But luckily, it turns out perfection is not a requirement of success in this type of work. I have found, as I'm sure many of you have as well, that when it comes to promoting nature connection, nature does the heavy lifting. We are the facilitators, we provide the inspiration and support, and nature really takes it from there. So despite many imperfections along the way, I feel Pearl has been a success for a couple of reasons. First, we've published some research I feel has contributed to the field. Two, we've received feedback from those on campus that our projects and programming are meaningful and valued additions to the William & Mary experience. Three, students have reported that they've really enjoyed working in the lab and that the experience has been valuable to them academically, professionally, and personally. So I survey my lab students at the end of each term about their experience. Now, there's a lot to say, so I've summarized the findings in this slide, um, but they cited the value of the research experience, additions to their job and grad school applications, they noted the experience influenced their academic and career goals, their own behaviors and perspectives. They felt working in the lab increased their social capital, you know, being able to be with like-minded people and their optimism, which I thought was very interesting. They also cited having gained invaluable life and career skills. I'm gonna share a couple quotes. There are so many good ones, but a couple I really like. Pearl made me feel like I contributed positively to a school I love. I see students in the green chairs and think about how they'd otherwise be holed up in the library. Working with Pearl has made me more aware of my own habits and helped me prioritize spending more time outside. I have started to appreciate the little things about the outdoors, like leaves on trees or the flowers or even something as simple as deer and rabbits. A pre-med student said, I'm excited to bring my knowledge of ecotherapy and park RX to the medical community. So my takeaway from these results is that even if your lab or your group doesn't accomplish anything earth shattering to transform your campus into some hotbed of nature connectedness, or you don't get published in the Journal of Nature, you will have still done a very great service to those who will go out into the world after this experience. I've actually asked a current Pearl student, Margot Vanyan, to share her experience working in the lab today. She'll be talking about this for a few minutes during session three. 
And last but not least, um, I feel the lab has been successful because it brings me immense joy. Doing work that's meaningful with a group of passionate and talented students, watching their creativity and bringing this work to our campus and seeing them integrate it into their lives, being able to talk nonstop for three hours every week about nature and ecotherapy and parks with others who also geek out on this has been so amazing. And getting some research publications out of all of it, it's pretty much heaven in my book. So from the start, my own enjoyment and fulfillment has been my guiding principle. And I encourage you all to allow this to guide you in this work as well. So how might you begin a group like this on your campus? So first I recommend taking an inventory of what I'll call your ingredients. So reflecting on my experience, there's several essential ingredients and a few nice to haves. I would count essential as the following. One, a passion for this work, but you have that or you wouldn't even be considering this. Um, two, perhaps the most challenging is time. In my case, I negotiated to have a course release to run my lab. Three, a steady flow of enthusiastic students. Thankfully, this has always been the easiest part of this equation for me, and I wager you would find the same. Four, a stomach for experimentation and what they call a growth mindset, perhaps. In other words, expect you'll make mistakes. You may waste time and money down fruitless paths. It's a learning process for everyone. I really don't feel any amount of intelligence, talent, support, or enthusiasm can buffer you from these challenges. Five, comfort challenging some potentially long-standing higher ed paradigms and norms, such as what a campus lab does or looks like. And six, these all wrapped up in a very healthy supply of patience and most of all, perseverance. And I'd say it'd be helpful to have these additional elements, a website. This has been huge for us. We had over 2,200 unique visitors to our site in the last year. So that's helped get out um, our name and what we're doing um, and also build this kind of concept of the importance of nature engagement on campuses. Um, peer collaborators are wonderful if you can find them, uh, particularly on your campus. The support of your institution and our department is also wonderful if you can get it. Um, and this may or may not include an advisory committee, uh, campus champions, or funding. But in my experience, if you're short on one or more of these, it's not necessarily a deal breaker. In fact, some of these may actually hinder or slow down your progress especially in the beginning, remaining flexible and agile with low overhead and no solid commitments can be very beneficial until you have solidified a configuration that works in your context. In my case, staying low key until I got my bearings was critical. So here is a summary, summary of these ingredients and we will be posting these slides on the website if you would like to reference any of them again. So I'd like to end with a couple of takeaways. First, to quote uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, I recommend you sit loosely in the saddle if you try to do this. Starting with minimal expectations and planning can sometimes be the best approach. It reduces the pressure, allowing you to remain flexible so you can refocus as needed. And a light hand helps keep the experience enjoyable for everyone involved, including yourself. Second, we can take lessons from nature about the importance of diversity, movement, evolution, and I'd also say patience. Um, try different kinds of approaches and various collaborators and configurations. This one was hard for me, but don't get stuck doing something that just isn't working. Even if you've invested a lot of time or money or effort in it, as they say in storytelling, sometimes you need to kill your darlings for the sake of the bigger picture. These entities constantly change and evolve and sometimes progress is very slow, um, but that is healthy. Third, learn for others, uh, from others and be inspired by others. For example, those presenting today and at last year's symposium, you can find the recordings for all of those presentations on campusnature.com. Definitely read Don Rakow's book on campus nature RX programs 
and consider his framework for the development of a campus nature rx program both of which you can find under resources on again campusnature.com fourth ultimately do what you can do and what you want to do with what you have fifth Remember to protect and prioritize your own nature time. As they say in the airlines, put your own mask on before you try to put it on others. I have learned to accept that this means projects will take longer. I have to say no more. I have to get really good at prioritizing and balancing, particularly since I have two very young children. But such modeling as social scientists are well aware sends a very powerful social message that nature engagement and time in nature is not a luxury, but an essential ingredient to a full and healthy life. And so helps shape healthy social norms that can cultivate a culture of nature connectedness on your campus and beyond. Finally, speaking to all my fellow recovering perfectionists out there, you don't have to do this perfectly for it to be worthwhile, perhaps even transformational for yourself, for your students or your campus. Again, you have nature on your side and I cannot think of a more inspirational and powerful ally. So thank you all for coming again today. I hope I shared something valuable for you. Please visit us at parksresearchlab.com to learn more about what we do, listen to podcasts and radio episodes about these topics, find resources for practicing and learning more about green space and ecotherapy, find links to follow Pearl on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Yes, my students have made a TikTok. They're amazing. Um, you could also find the link to watch the documentary short film I co-produced with Tanya Stadelman called Nurture with Nature. And I will leave you with this wonderful quote by Eckhart Tolle. And I think we have a couple of minutes for any questions.